All right, so I uh, mentioned last week we're doing a uh, Bible study essentially on Sunday mornings now for the next few weeks uh, like we would normally do on a Wednesday night. And I encourage you, if you don't normally come to church on, really, if you, especially if you don't ever come to church on any other day but Sunday morning, to try coming to more services other than just Sunday morning. There's a lot that uh, you're missing out on if you only make it to one service throughout the week. So um, this is a little taste of what you get on Wednesday nights. We'll go through verse by verse through these chapters. And um, it's, just, it's just another way of studying the Bible and understanding uh, and getting preaching from the Word of God. I also chose 1 John because there's a lot of really good core doctrines in here that we ought to be going through as well. So let's, um, let's start off here in verse number 1. We'll dig right into the chapter. The Bible reads, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And I, I covered this a little bit last week. As I was expounding on verses uh, from chapter 1, verses 7, 8, and 9 uh, re regarding, you know, sinning and, uh, and the, really chapter 1 talked a lot about fellowship and we're going to continue to see that as well into chapter 2. So there's a big difference when it comes to your fellowship with God or just being saved, right? Those are two different concepts. So you can, you can be saved, you can have your soul saved through what Jesus Christ did for you and not have very good fellowship with Jesus, with the Father. You could, you could have a, a bad relationship or a bad walk uh, as a Christian, as a believer, if you're walking in the flesh and doing things you're not supposed to do. So these are two extremely important concepts you have to have to be able to separate in your mind because there's a lot of false teachers out there that try to conflate those two things into being the same thing. Living a righteous life and doing good does not say, oh, well, then you just, you, you know, you're saved. If you don't do good things, then you're not saved. That is not true. Because being saved is a free gift. It has nothing to do with our works. Yeah. The Bible says, for by grace, grace is unmerited and undeserved. Are you saved through faith? Faith is what you believe. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Our works do not save us. You do not need to have works in order to be saved. Christ did all the works for us. We have to put our confidence, our trust, our belief, our faith in him, in what he did, in the, the atonement that he made for us when he died on the cross, shed his blood, and rose again from the dead. That's what we're trusting in for our salvation. So please, as we go through this, and it's, gonna, and it's going to be expounded on further, we need to make that distinction and understand as we dig into doctrine and start to, to read what's being written here that it's very clear that these two things are separate. You know, the Bible talks about being saved as, as being born again. So when you're born again, you become a child of God. But the Bible says, but as many as received him, referring to Christ, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Believers are born again. They become children of God the moment that they put their trust in Jesus. Now, we all have parents that are sitting in this room. Some may have passed on already, but the point is we're all brought into this world with a mother and a father. Now, as human beings, mother and father aren't always the best mother and father, right? But you know what? No matter how bad of a parent they are, or no matter how bad of a child you are, nothing ever changes the fact that you are their child. Like, that's just something that can never be undone. There's a, there's a, a blood relationship there. There's DNA. You are their child. It's the same thing with salvation. You're born again. You're born of the Spirit. Okay, there's a new birth there. There's a new creature there. Your heavenly father is going to be your father now forever. You're a child of God. So that's good. But just as with a human family, hey, in, in my house, for example, when my children are obeying my commands and doing what I tell them to do and listening to me and respecting me and, and taking heed to what I say, we have a great relationship. It's a great relationship, right? everybody's happy, no one's upset, no one's getting spankings, you know, like there's no crying, it's, it's all good. 
But when there's disobedience, when the kids are getting, you know, rebellious or stubborn or not wanting to do things and being disobedient to what I'm telling them to do, that's when there's friction. That's when there's problems. That's when there's crying. That's when people are getting upset, right? And then it's not pleasant for anybody. Well, it's the same way with a believer's walk. And this is a lot of, of First John is teaching about our fellowship with God, right? How we can make him happy, how we could have a good fellowship, how we could be close to God, how we could know God, how we could be in those good standings, good graces with our Father. And as you'll see, it's all going to boil down to your works. What are you doing? Are you being obedient? Are you listening to him? J just as it would in, in, a, in a human family, right? In a, just a physical relationship with your, with your own family. It's very similar. So it's, it's a real simple concept, but you have to be aware because there's so many false teachers out there. They're going to try to tell you, oh, wait, no, look, see, you did this sin or you did that sin. So that means you're not saved. It's like, no, that's not what this passage is talking about. But let's, let's keep going here because he says here, he just got done saying in chapter one that we all have sin. If we say we don't have sin, we're, we're a liar. We're deceiving ourselves. And then in chapter 2 here, verse 1, he says, My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And in chapter 1, he said, These things I write unto you that your joy may be full. They go hand in hand. Not sinning and having a joyful life. Right? Sin brings death. Sin brings misery. Sin brings destruction. Well, guess what? If you don't have those things, if you could live a life, which we know is impossible to 100% live without sin. We, we know that. But that doesn't mean you throw up your hands and give up. You still continue to strive to live as good as you can, to, 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 to strive for that perfection that God demands of us, and, and that will bring the joy. And he's writing these things, and you say, hey, look, I don't want you to sin. But, he says, and if any man sin, since I'm commanding you not to sin, but, hey, if you sin, though, we know that we have an advocate with the Father. So when you sin, what happens? God's going to be angry at you, right? Because you're sinning, you're breaking his commandments, you're not listening to him, you're not obeying him. But you know what? We still, we still have an advocate. And that advocate is Jesus Christ, the righteous. The Bible says and he is the propitiation for our sins. He's the one that makes it right. He's the one who's made the sacrifice. He's the one who's redeemed us. And I love this. It says, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This one verse destroys the limited atonement of Calvinism. For those of you who know what I'm talking about, there's, there's a false doctrine out there, a false belief that's held by a lot of Reformed churches, uh, uh, Presbyterian churches, Lutheran churches of, of that persuasion that will teach Calvinism, that teaches that, that they have this, this acronym TULIP and all the letters mean something, but L stands for limited atonement. And what they mean by that is that Christ didn't die for everybody. It is wicked. They'll teach that Christ only died for those people who get saved, and he only paid the punishment for those people who got saved, and not for everyone. Well, clearly, clearly here, you don't have to do, I don't have to do any twisting and try to, 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 do, to you know, say a whole bunch of fancy words and, and, and do mental gymnastics to try to teach to you that, no, Christ didn't just die for the believer, but he died for the sins of the whole world, because that's literally what the passage just said that we read. Verse number two, he is a propitiation for our sins. Yeah, but they're believers. Yeah, okay. But yeah, we know they're believers. But then he says, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And even in the context of this chapter, we're going to see he talks about the world and not loving the world. So when he, oh, when he says the, for the sins of the whole world, he means the whole saved world. No, he doesn't. Because in the context of this very passage, he's going to define the world. And all that is in the world, as, as we'll see as we continue on this. So you, can't, you cannot try to twist this to mean anything other than what it just directly says. And watch out when people do that too. Well, I know that's what this says, but what you have to understand is... And then they start telling you anything. <laughs> just like, uh, what you understand, at the, the culture at that time, mm, what you have to understand is... Uh, well, you know, you know, like whatever, and, and, try, and try to dodge or get around or explain away why a verse says what it says. Look, it, it, it's not that complicated. 
So this is a great passage. If you, if you ever run across someone's Calvin's, I mean, 1 John 2.2, 2, awesome, awesome verse to just show people the error of limited atonement. Verse number three, and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Now, this is, you say, well, Pastor Berzins, why does it say we can know that we know him if we keep his commandments? I thought you said we don't have to do works to be saved. We don't have to do works to be saved. But saying this is how we know that we know him. Now, keep your place here. Turn, if you would, to Galatians chapter 4. Because really knowing God and getting to know God, understanding God, understanding who he is, knowing him, it's going to require you to be keeping his commandments. You're going to be knowing and learning more about God by listening to him and obeying him. That's how we get to know him. But here's what happens. You know, the moment you get saved, you don't just automatically just know God that well. You may know him a little, right, because you've known enough to be able to get saved. But what's more important for salvation is the fact that he knows you. Amen. And in Galatians chapter 4, verse number 8, the Bible says, How be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. So he's saying, you know, in the past, before you were saved, before you knew God, you did service unto them who which by nature are no gods. So you had false religion, false gods, you know, you believed in something else. But now, after that you have known God, but then there's, he, he adds this phrase, or rather are known of God. How turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. So he says, now look, after you've known God, but, but actually rather you're, you're known of God. How are you going back? How are you returning to some, um, you know, to some sins and the weak and beggarly elements and being in bondage to that? So he's saying, why are you going back to this stuff? Go back, if you would, to 1 John chapter 2. So knowing him and being known of him are two different things. When you get saved, you're known of God because you're, you're his child. You're his son. You're his daughter. He knows you. And you'll be accepted with him into the kingdom through the blood of Christ. Because of what Christ did for you, gave you that, that inheritance, that eternal inheritance that belongs to you. But if you really want to get to know your father, you need to start listening and obeying him. That's how you're going to know him. It just says, hereby do we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Verse 4, he that saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. And look, this, is, this should be a, a very sobering passage for a lot of people. If people actually care about the word of God and you hear this verse and if someone were asking you, you'd be like, hey, do you know God? Do you know him? Do you know Jesus? Oh, yeah, I know God. I know Jesus. You're like, I know him. I know him good. Well, let's, you know, start examining your life. How well do you know him? Are you keeping his commandments? Or do you just go like, yep, don't follow that, 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 don't follow that. Don't. I don't think you know him very well. You claim to know him, but, but your actions are proving otherwise and the scripture is telling you otherwise. See, it's, it's, it's not enough. This isn't just something that, you know, I came up with on my own just saying, well, I don't really see how you could say you know him if, if you're not doing like the Bible says you should be doing. Not that that would be a bad thought, but like it literally says that in the scripture. And it's saying you're a liar. So you, you just, you know, everyone just think about that for yourself. If someone were to ask you, hey, how well do you know God? Do you know God? And then if you say yes, Okay, well, are you, are you keeping his commandments? There's a lot of commandments, by the way, too. It's not just the Ten Commandments. There's a lot of commandments in Scripture. There's a, there's a commandment that's what, one of my favorite commandments just because it's, it's so broad. You know, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. 
So some people are really good at abstaining from overtly sinful things, right? Abstaining from getting drunk, abstaining from fornication. And look, amen, right? Amen. That's great. You ought to be able to abstain from those things. Abstaining from stealing, abstaining from murder, abstaining from, from, from so many of these critical uh, uh, sins that we ought not to be doing. And look, if you're guilty of that stuff, then it's like, well, how would you say you know God? Right? But on top of that, I would say, okay, you're abstaining from stuff, but, but are you doing anything? Like, are you serving the Lord? Because that was you know, the Great Commission, for example, by Jesus Christ said, you know, go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Yeah. Are you being obedient to that call? Are you being obedient to, to doing good, essentially, just doing what God would have you to do? Because the Christian life is not just a set of don't do this. It's, yeah, don't do these things, but also you need to be doing this with your life. It's, it's both sides there. We, we ought to be balanced and have both in our life and be able to know and be confident to say that, yes, I, um, I know God. I know him. Now, of course, none of us are going to know him perfectly here on this earth. But, you know, there's one day we're going we're gonna to be like him for we're going to see him as he is. Right? We get new bodies and we're going to be fully redeemed. And that's a great day to look forward to. But at the same time, look, we can't just throw away this verse. It means something. Right? He that saith, I know him, keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And we've already established, he already says, look, we know that we all have sin. Right? If you say you're without sin, you're a liar. So this teaching is already taken into consideration that we're not perfect. So we know that we're not perfect. It's already been established in chapter 1. He prefaced what he's getting into here by stating the obvious None of us is perfect. None of us can say we're without sin. Okay. However, as we continue, you know, he's going to continue to expound further and further once we get that settled. Okay. Now, look, if you're going to say you know God, how can you even say that and you're not even keeping his commandments? And we all know, I'm sure you could think of, there's plenty of people that you can have conversations with. They've like never even read the Bible through one time and just say they know all this about God. Like, how could you say you know about God when you haven't even read his word? How could you say that? You don't know God. The most basic thing, just, just, just all of this, the word of God, the word. You don't know Jesus if you haven't read the Bible. Because the Bible is the Word. And you know who else is the Word? Jesus is the Word. Amen. Jesus is the Word made flesh. Jesus embodies the Bible, the Word of God. He is the Word incarnate. If you don't know this, you don't know Jesus. Now, hopefully you know enough about Jesus to get saved, and he knows you. That's the most important thing, but, that, but again, that's the beginning. That's the start. Don't go walking around saying how well you know God if you're not keeping his commandments. And how can you keep his commandments if you don't even know what they are? Let's keep reading here. Verse number five. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. And again, he's calling out people that say things, right? Oh, you say you know God? Hey, if you, if you say you know God and you're not keeping his commandments, you don't really know him. And then he says, you say you abide in him? You say you live with him? You say you're in God? Well, then you ought to walk that way. You ought to do that way. Keep your place again in 1 John 2. Turn back to John chapter 15. A lot of what we're reading here is very similar to what Jesus taught in John chapter 15, which is also a passage that is commonly taken out of context or just misapplied and, and mistaught to be talking about salvation when it's not. John 
John chapter 15, we're going to start reading in verse number 1. The Bible reads, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, the, just like what we're reading in First John, uh, just in general, about, about sinning and fellowship and everything, this is about bearing fruit. So he says, every branch in me that is in Christ, but doesn't bear fruit, he says he's going to take that away. It doesn't mean that that person isn't saved. They are in Christ, but they're not doing anything. They're not bearing fruit. And he's like, look, you're here for a purpose. And this is what God has put us on this, on this planet for a purpose. Just like Ephesians chapter 2, hey, verses 8 and 9 talk clearly about salvation being a free gift. It's grace. It has nothing to do with us. But then verse 10 says, hey, but where is workmanship created unto good works? Like, this is why you're here. Now you need to do good. You need to serve. You need to be a minister of the gospel. You need to live your life right. And you need to bring forth fruit. You need to bring other people. You need to evangelize. You need to bring forth more Christians, more believers, disciple people, get them baptized, get them saved. Obviously not in that order. <laughs> We need to be doing those things and bringing forth fruit because if God's got a job for you to do as his son, as his servant, hey, look, I've got work for you to do. And then you're just not doing it, not doing it, not doing it. He's saying like, you know what? I'm just going to cast that to the side. I'm going to cast you to the side. You're not, you're not doing what I need you to do. You're not, you're not doing it. So you're good for nothing. Like, hey, I'm glad you're saved, but like, no, no, thank God, God's long suffering. And merciful, right? Because I'm sure after I was saved, if God wasn't long-suffering, I'd already be gone. But he is long-suffering. He gives us opportunities and thank the Lord for that. But we still have to be mindful because this isn't just spoken in vain to tell us that, hey, I am the true vine. Jesus Christ speaking. I'm the true vine. And look, if you, every branch in me that's not bearing forth fruit we're going to be taken away. And if you are bearing fruit, guess what? We're going to purge you so you can bring forth more fruit. And you know, that purging, it's going to be a little cut here, a little snip there, a little trimming up and, and getting things right. And it may not be the most pleasant experience getting, getting everything cut out that's not good, the dead weight that's preventing you from really bearing forth a lot of fruit. But you know what? In the end, it's going to, it's going to be very helpful and help you to bring forth a lot more fruit. Verse 3 says, Now ye are clean, through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. Again, this isn't talking about losing your salvation. It's talking about, hey, if you're going to be fruitful and do work for God, you've got to be in Christ. You've got to be living with him. You've got to be abiding with him. You've got to be close to him because he's the one that brings the life. He's the one that's going to bring. You can't do it in your own power. You can't go out uh, you know, soul winning and trying to get converts in your own power. It has to be through the power of Christ, through the power of the Holy Ghost. You've got to have that with you or else you're going to fall flat on your face. You, just, you can't do it through your, own, through your own eloquence, through your own words, your own fanciful speeches. None of that is going to work. You need the power of God. Verse 4, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. And this is where people will say, oh, see, look, you go to hell. But that's not what that verse says. That's not what it says. It's using an analogy about fruit and trees that bring forth fruit, and then we got we got branches that aren't bringing forth the fruit. What's going to happen? We're going to cut that out, and then there's nothing else left for that to do. But then it's just going to perish, right? Now, just because it says that they're going to use wood and put it in fire doesn't automatically mean that is a reference to hell. Now, it could be, right? Like just in general, when we're reading this, that would be not a bad thought to have and be like, hey, I wonder, it's bringing up things being cast in fire. I wonder if this is a reference to hell. That's not, it's not a, like a, 
you know, it's, it's obviously logical to, to make that thought, to have that thought and to think about it. But when you're reading it, you have to get the context and understand, hey, this isn't talking about hell. <laughs> because no believer, no one that has eternal life is going to end up in hell. And, and that can be established by so many other concrete, uh, uh, very clear verses that we can't apply this in this way. That, hey, look, branch, they get gathered, cast them in the fire, and they're burned. I would say the same way that a person can just be cast aside, their body is going to die, your body is going to perish. You're done. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Right? Blessing of God. You're listening, you're obeying, you're being fruitful. Amen. Just like a good son, a good daughter in a relationship with, a, with our Heavenly Father. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. Being a disciple is a laborer, is a worker. It's you're doing, you're, you're performing good works, you're bearing much fruit. But you don't have to be a disciple to be saved. Again, very, very important to understand that. Disciples follow, they work, they serve, they do as Jesus did. But when a verse is talking about a disciple, that means you're literally following him and doing as he would do. But that is not a requirement for salvation because salvation is a free gift. If that was a requirement for, a sal for salvation, you cannot say salvation is a free gift. You'd have to just say, well, no, here's the contract. You're going to be employed and you have to do all this work and then you'll receive eternal life. But that's not the way it works. It's free. It's a gift. It's not of ourselves. It's what he did for us. So let's continue on here. Verse 9, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Isn't that interesting? It's also the same way that you know God. You keep his commandments. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Wow, isn't that, if you were here last week, isn't this exactly what uh, chapter 1 was talking about too? Chapter 1 and 2 talk about keep his commandments and that your joy may be full. Same thing that we're seeing here in John chapter 15. It's a great connection to draw to parallel of the same truth that's being taught. And in both passages, people try to, to yank this stuff out and make it say something that it doesn't. But they both support each other doctrinally completely um, with what's being taught. This is my commandment, verse 12 that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. It's the same thing as saying, oh yeah, I know Jesus, but you don't keep his commandments. How well can you really know him? Jesus said, hey, you're my friends, if you do what I tell you to do. And again, so if you're not doing what he's telling you to do, then guess what? He, Jesus isn't going to consider you a friend. But that doesn't mean you're not saved. It doesn't mean you're not a child of God. You still have that, that inseparable relationship, but friendship is not the same as sonship, right? Being in the family. You, you can pick and choose your friends. And, and that can be based on your actions. But... Being born into a family, once that's done, that's done. There's no changing that. And you want to be a friend, you want to be close to Jesus, then you better start doing what he commands to do. Let's go back to 1 John chapter 2. Verse number 7, the Bible reads, Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. And, you know, he says it's not a new commandment. And he says there's a new commandment. But then he explains why he says it's a new commandment. Because the light is shined in the darkness. Right? So there's a lot of Old Testament that you already had from the beginning. But then in the New Testament, there's light shined on that old commandment 
to bring a better and a deeper understanding in the New Testament and say, oh, wow, yeah, that makes perfect sense. This, this really uh, opens up my understanding so it's like a new commandment, even though it's, it's been there the whole time. Verse 9, He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. So continuing to prove whether or not you think you're as good as you say you are, right? You're saying, oh, I know God. Oh, I, I'm, I'm a friend of God. Oh, you know, all these things. But he's, he, he's just flat out saying, if you don't keep the commandments, if you don't do this, then that's not true. You're lying to yourself. You're deceiving yourself. If you think that you don't sin, you deceive yourself. And if you think you're so godly and so holy and you're so right with God, but you hate your brother, the Bible says you're in darkness. You're not in the light. And let that sink in too. You think you have this great walk with God and I'm so holy and I'm so righteous and you hate your brother or sister in Christ, man, you're in darkness. You don't even know what it's all about. Hate not a brother or sister in Christ. That's, that, is, that is wicked and that's wrong. And, you know, you, don't, you clearly don't know. Um, you, you, you're not walking in the light that you think you're walking in. Show me the brother or sister in Christ that, that Jesus hated. You're not going to find one. And this is, you know, the Bible says that, that the, the, the whole law and the commandments are, are, are wrapped up basically in two things. Loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. All the law, all the commandments are wrapped up in those two very simple statements. If you love God with all your heart, you're not going to go after strange gods. You're not going to commit sacrilege. You're not going to do anything against God if you love God. right? You're also going to be listening to him and obeying him. And if you love your brother as yourself, if you love your neighbor as yourself, if you love man, then you're not going to be doing wrong by them either. You're not going to be stealing. You're not going to be killing. You know, you're not going to be doing all the, the, the sins and infractions against mankind. That encompasses the whole law. So loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. That's all the law and the commandments all wrapped up pretty nicely into those two things. So if you're hating your brother, that's like one, one of the two things that, that, that you're in contradiction to. Now, we all have friction and drama and different things in life, but, but here's the thing. You can be irritated, you can have some issues with people, but it better not be a hatred. If someone's born, you know, your brother or sister in Christ, like, like, don't hate them. And don't ever let that get to some, some hatred. Okay, you don't have to be best friends with everybody, but, but you better not be hating people in your heart. Because then you got, you got a serious problem if you do, because now you're in darkness. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. Verse 11, but he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth because the darkness hath blinded his eyes. I mean, that's how bad it is if you have hatred in your heart for a brother and sister in Christ. You, you, you're, you're just completely in darkness and you don't, even know, you don't even know what's going on. You're not seeing clearly at all. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. And now, now we're getting into the section where he, say, he writes on the little children, he writes on the fathers, and he writes on the young men. And he repeats this um, again. And he says here, I write, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you because you're saved. Little children, right? Babes in Christ, little children. I write unto you because your sins are forgiven. Amen, that's great. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. And remember, we're just talking about knowing God. So I believe it's talking about the fathers, the more mature Christians, the more mature believers. You've known him. You're obeying his commandments. You're, you know, you've known him. And here, there's something, notice this, there's something for everybody. He's writing to the little children, he's writing to the fathers, and he's writing to the young men. It's kind of three different age groups from the little ones to the, to, the, to the young adults, kind of mature, and then to the mature, right? Fathers, you've known him this from the beginning. I write unto you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. 
which is similar to being saved, right? But I think there's, there's more to it, the way that it's worded to overcome the wicked one, because you're growing, you're doing good, you're zealous, you know, you're, 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 you're getting these victories, right? They're in an exciting phase of your life of, 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 a, of a younger Christian, but, but a young man. You've overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you've known the Father. I've written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. And, and that's literally the exact same phrase that he used previously. Like it's the exact same verse repeated there to the fathers. And I've written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. So everyone ought to be paying attention. The little ones, you're saved. The, the young men, hey, you're, you're zealous, you're on fire, you're overcoming the wicked one. And then the, the, the fathers, hey, you've known him. You've known him. You've known him from the beginning. You know, you know him. And that's, we ought to progress and mature spiritually as well and be able to hear from all of these epistles, all of the word of God, and take uh, what we could learn from all of it, no matter what, what spiritual growth stage you're in. Verse 15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Another test, right? Another test. No, no, I love God. I love God. Man, I love God with all my heart. I love God. But do you love the world? Well, what, what do you mean? What do you mean you love the world? Verse 16 says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now, first of all, before we even dig in any deep, if you'd never heard preaching, if you didn't really know what it's talking about, if you have things that are of God and things that are of the world, is it, does it really sound that complicated? Just, just in general, be like, okay, there's stuff out there. Let's put it this way. If it's not of the Father, then what is it? It's going to be of the world. Amen. Right? And look, we live in the world. But we're not of the world. We live in this world where we're supposed to love the Father and not love the world. You say, okay, well, what are the, the things of the Father are clearly taught in Scripture. The things of the Father, it's, he, say, he teaches, you know what, don't get wrapped up on the cares and the riches of this world that's going to choke you out and, and, and distract you from serving me. But what is it to be Christ-like? What are the things of the Father? Well, what are the things that Christ was taught to do? He was a minister. He served. He preached the gospel. He helped other people. He did good unto others. I mean, he, this is the way that Christ walked. Okay, well, that's, those would be things of the Father. Things of the world. Everything the world puts out to distract you, to entertain you, to, to you know, all, all the things that you could, if you just look at something and be like, does this look like it's of the Father? I mean, you, you put some media in front of your face, whether it be online or on the television or whatever, and you, and you just look at this and be like, does this look like something that the Father put out? And here, there's your litmus test. If it doesn't look like something that the Father put out, then it's of the world. Amen. Now, then you have to ask yourself, do I love that? Is that where my heart is? Is that where my desire is? Is that what I need to have? Is that, is that what's consuming all my time? Love of the Father is not in you. If you're loving the world and you're loving the things of the world and you're all wrapped up in all the events, all the attraction, all the things that the world has to offer you and that's just what you love and that's what you live for, the love of the Father is not in you. Some hard truths in 1 John chapter 2 about, about the people who want to claim to be so spiritual, claim to love God, I know him, I love him, but do you? It sounds like the Apostle John is like just laying into people who have this great spiritual talk and nothing to show for it. And look, I, I don't want you sitting here today and just thinking about everybody else. Apply it to yourself. You ask yourself, if, if, God were, if someone were to ask God about you, God, how's your relationship with this person? And that person's you. 
what would God respond? How would he respond? How faithful are you? Would he say, that's my friend? He said that of Abraham. You say, well, God can never say, he said that of Abraham. He talked to Moses face to face like a man does with his friend, the Bible says. And look, we know that they weren't sinless. So this isn't teaching that you have to be 100% perfect to have a good relationship with God. Because they were sinners too, but you know what? They did have a good relationship. They were close to God. They did abide with God. They, did, uh, uh, they were doing the works. They were listening to him imperfectly, yet they still were able to achieve that level of righteousness to be able to say like, yeah, God's, God's considering me to be a friend. I know Abraham. I know how he's going to raise his family. I know how he's going to lead his household. He had a good report. And we're going through the Bible memory in Hebrews chapter 11. There's a lot of people who had a good report with God. And their stories are being told because they had that great faith. Would the same be said about you? And we got some, some, some hard truths in here and you need to, to analyze for yourself and it's like, how much am I in the world? How much do I love the world? Because if I'm just in the world and I'm loving the world, you know what? The love of the Father is not in you. you say, well, what's in the world? The lust of the flesh, all the things that your body is drawing you to, the lust of the eyes, all the things you want to put in front of your eyes. And that's not just, you know, sexual things. Those are things that could be anything that, that, that your eyes are just... You really want to consume whatever with your eyes. And the pride of life. It's not of the Father, but is of the world. And there's an entire sermon packed into those verses there that I'm not going to spend any more time on because I'm already running behind schedule. Let's keep going here through this passage. Verse number 17, And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. Look, but that world, all that, all that meaningless stuff that you could distract yourself with and, and not be in the love of God, it's all going to go away anyways. So it's just so stupid. It's so vain. It's just going to be gone. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And you serve God, you'll be rewarded eternally and you're doing things that matter and you're doing things that actually last. Verse 18, little children, it is the last time. And yet, as you have heard, that Antichrist shall come. And this is what I would say. We know that there's an Antichrist, like the Antichrist, to come. That there's, there's prophetical uh, scripture that talks about the Antichrist who's going to come and just be in a position of power and he's going to basically establish a one-world government, all that. He, he mentions him here. He says, look, you know that Antichrist shall come. He says, even now are there many Antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. And if there's many antichrists, and John said, you know what, there's still a lot of antichrists today. But then he, he says this, because these antichrists, they're not exactly the same as the antichrist, but they're very similar. They're similar in that they're antichrists, right? They're, they're, they're the opposite of Christ. They're not, uh, they're, but they're taking on a role similar to as if they are Christ or if they are good people, if they're serving the Lord and they're not. Verse 19 says this, they went out from us, but they were not of us. So these are the people that creep in. They want to they get the name that they're, oh yeah, we're part of this movement. We're part of your group. We're just like you. But then they go out and, and show their true colors and their true beliefs and who they really are and be like, no, no, those are actually antichrists. He says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, look at this, they would no doubt have continued with us. There's no doubt. But when the people go out and be like, oh yeah, I was an independent for the last once, and now I'm, I, I went out and, and I'm praying the rosary and doing all this other stuff. It's like, look, they went out from us, but they were not of us. Right. Yep. That's, that's something that's never going to happen. Because the Bible says they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. 
So the reason why they went out is because of just to make it known because it, it wasn't really true in their heart. They weren't really saved. They weren't really brethren. They, they went out to just, exp that just exposes the fact that they were never one of us. They were just pretending. They were just wolves in sheep's clothing. And look, the Bible gives a lot of warning about that. And the world may mock and, and make fun of that. Oh, your conspiracy theories. Look, it's truth. And you need to be warned and understand that these people are out there and people will come in and they'll try to infiltrate and, and pretend to be like one of us. And then they leave and it's like, wow, they just go way off the deep end. And it's like, yeah, they were never of us. And they went out just to make it known, make it manifest that they were not all of us. Verse 20 says, but ye have an unction from the Holy One and ye know all things. An unction is like, is an anointing. Okay, so we have, we have this anointing from, from the Holy One to help us and to guide us into all truth and wisdom. So, so we can see these things and understand, just as the Apostle John is teaching here, that look, they went out from us, but they're not all of us. We have an unction from the Holy One. We're going to no doubt continue. Um, and, and, and continuing with us, it doesn't mean that people can't get out of church or else, oh, see, look, they're a false, they're a false brethren because they got out of church. That's not what this is teaching. Right? If someone backslides and gets out of church, that doesn't just mean, see, they weren't ever saved from the beginning. Yeah. No, it's, it's the false brethren. This is, these are the people who go out that are antichrist. Right? Because the antichrist stay religious. The antichrist stay trying to persuade and proselytize and do things. Right, But, they're, but they end up teaching the damnable heresies and 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 the wicked doctrines of devils, that's what antichrists do. Not This isn't talking about your average person in the pew that just backslides, they get into sin, they get out of church. Because you know what? Those people, they'll still have the same belief. They've just got carried away with the cares of the world. Right? When I was completely backslidden and just totally out of church and just living for the world, there's no way I would have ever told you anything different about being saved other than believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Like that, that was always the same. You remain saved. And yeah, there was a backsliding time, but then it's like, you know, you get back in it. I still would have been with <laughs> the, the, the church or with the apostles, with the, you know, with the, the, the true people of God and not just all of a sudden jumping ship and going over and, and doing all this other, all these other antichrist religions. Uh, verse number 21, I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it. And that no lie is of the truth. And look, that's important to understand too. There's a lot of lies that people say that they, they want to make lies seem true, which is why when, when a, a, the truth is twisted, it looks close to the truth, but no lie is of the truth. The truth doesn't bring forth lies. Okay, bottom line, the truth, Jesus never lied. Jesus is the truth, and, and no truth is of, or no lie is of the truth, right? It just, it just can't happen. But then he continues to say this, verse 22, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. And man, would to God that, that more of Christianity in general could read with understanding here. Amen. Because there is a love of a religion that denies Christ and exalts that religion and in some, in some cases worships that religion religion or people of that religion by people who call themselves Christians. You know, a lot of you, almost all of you probably know what I'm talking about right now. Yep. It's the type of people, like one that lives not too far from me, that has the American flag and then the Israeli flag flying up at their home. And I've never met those people, but I can almost guarantee you they're not from Israel, like physically. There's this Christian that is exalting the nation of Israel and the Jews. And when I'm talking about Jews, I'm talking about religious Jews. Because that's what they are anyways. There's, they're really, I don't, I don't even think there is an ethnic 
Jew. Like I don't, I don't, they've been so intermixed and you know, spread abroad in general just throughout the history of, as a people that, that how could you even determine who is an ethnic Jew anyways? And look, God's not racist. I'm not racist. It doesn't matter to me who your ancestors were. That means nothing. But you know what? Your religion matters a lot. And the Bible says here, who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, he is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Now, what's the religion that denies that Jesus is the Christ? Judaism? Because they actually believe there is a Christ, but it's not Jesus. Now, there's other religions, too, that will deny that Jesus is the Christ. And you know what? They're antichrist, too. But as we keep reading, you're going to see there's a, there's a high pressure and push on this wicked religion of Judaism that John is exposing and getting people to understand, like, look, this is Antichrist. There have been many Antichrists, and look, they were, they were with us, but, but they were not of us. You know, they, if they would have been with us, they would have continued. They're not of, uh, of the Father, and they're not of the truth. Verse 23 says, Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. Because a lot of people will say, it says here in verse 22, He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Well, they don't deny the Father. They just deny the Son. Right? Because they'll claim to believe in the same God that we believe in, the Lord, Jehovah, the God of the Bible. But they don't. They don't. That's not the God they believe in. It doesn't matter what they say. Just like a, a Jehovah's Witness will tell you they believe in Jesus. But they don't. It's a different Jesus. It's a Jesus that's not deity. It's a Jesus that's really like Michael the Archangel. Okay, that's not Jesus Christ. So in similar fashion, the Jews, they don't worship the Father. They don't worship Jehovah. They have a different God that they've made up. They have a whole different set of understanding about, about who God even is than what the Bible says. They didn't believe him. Jesus says, Jesus even told them, hey, look, you claim to believe Moses, but he said they don't even believe Moses because if you'd believe his writings, they'd also believe Jesus' words. Right. Amen. If he, he says, look, Moses spake of me. Moses wrote of me. <laughs> Moses prophesied of Jesus. And like, look, if you really believed Moses, then you'd have to believe me. You'd have to accept me because Moses spake of me. He wrote of me. It's that evident. And in verse 23 says, Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. So you can't have the Father without the Son. Mm -hmm. right. And as we continue on, we'll get, as we get into chapter 5, we'll see clearly you know, the Trinity being taught here, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, these three are one. Sure. You can't separate God out and, and separate, well, no. You know, I, I believe in, this, in, in the Father, but like the Son, the son yeah, that's not, he's not part of God. No, you can't do that. Because God exists, and you can't, you can't start cutting up God and taking out part of God and then be left with the same God. You can't do that. It says, Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. You can't, you can't split it up. You got the Son, you've got the Father. You deny the Son, you deny the Father. It's clear. Verse uh, 2 John, if you want to look there real quick, in, in the, epi the second epistle of John, just a few pages to the right, verse number 7, the Bible reads, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So again, teaching the same thing. Now why would we have exaltation and love and support for people who are antichrist? For anyone, anyone that's going to be antichrist, why as a Christian are you going to say, I need to support an antichrist? That doesn't make sense. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. And I don't know anyone who would say, yeah, I support an antichrist, which is why you need to put the label appropriately. And people need to get in the Bible and read the Bible and pastors need to be exposing this and be saying, look, the people that reject the son are antichrist. They are antichrist. So let's not support antichrists. Amen. 
even in the book of Revelation, they're referred to as the synagogue of Satan. Revelation 2.9 says, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them, which say they are Jews, but are not, but are the, uh, the synagogue of Satan. The Bible teaches that he's not a Jew, which is one outwardly in the flesh, but he's a Jew, which is one inwardly. And it's, it's a circumcision is that of the heart and not of the flesh. So that's, that's what God sees and that's what matters to the Lord. Just like John the Baptist said, uh, think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father, because God is able these stones to raise up seed unto Abraham. It doesn't matter. Your, your physical genealogy doesn't matter. The Bible says avoid genealogies. The, the physical Jew means nothing to God. But we still want him to get saved. Just like anyone of any other religion, anyone else who doesn't have Christ, we're going to love them and teach and preach the gospel to them. But you know what? They're still the enemies of the cross as long as they subscribe to their anti-Christ religion. But hey, they're welcome to receive Christ and then they can be grafted back into that olive tree that they were broken out of. John chapter 8, turn there real quick. Man, this is going a little bit longer than I wanted it to. But this is an important point. And again, this isn't, this isn't the anti-Semitic Jew of the Apostle John. <laughs> right? See, well, that's anti-Semitic. The Apostle John was a Jew. He wrote this. I didn't write this. He's the one that said to watch out for the Antichrist. He's the one that, that was a Jew. But he understood the truth. And, and how, about, how about just from the, word, from the mouth of Jesus Christ himself? Amen. Was Jesus Christ anti-Semitic? <laughs> Another physical Jew. Is, I mean, is that even possible? It's funny, it just reminds me of like, the world is so crazy these days. I, man, I, I wish I could remember all the context. I don't know. I kind of saw it in passing. It wasn't a big deal, but I saw this video and, and they were saying that like, there was, there was a black gentleman that was, I don't even remember what he was saying. I don't know if he was like endorsing Trump or, or, or something like that. And then people were saying that, like people literally were saying that like he was, like a white supremacist or something. <laughs> and I'm going like, are we in the twilight zone? Like this is, this is stupid. The, the level of, of propaganda out there and, and how much people have lost their minds. Like, are, are you really, like really? You're going to say that? Like you think you get away with saying something like that and people are just going to eat that up and believe that and think that like, I don't know. It, it, was, it was bizarre. It's totally bizarre. But that would be the same thing like calling Jesus anti-Semitic. He's not against the, the, the race of people or whatever, right? Like, it's, that's not it. The, 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 the people that descended from Shem, which is what Semitic is. John 8, 41. The Bible reads, Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. And, and here in the context, he's talking to Pharisees. He's talking to these religious Jews that rejected Christ, that rejected him. And he's calling them out. And he says, you know what? You do the deeds of your father. Jesus said unto them, verse 42, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And what does the Bible say about um, who is a liar? He that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. So when you have a whole religion of people that deny that Jesus is the Christ, you know who that religion, the father of that religion is? Satan. Because he's the father of all lies. 
It's a satanic religion. Judaism is a satanic religion. Because they are not of the Heavenly Father. They're of their father, the devil, just like Jesus Christ said. You know, modern-day Judaism is the religion of the Pharisees. It is the continuation of the Pharisaical religion. And that's pretty easy to see all the similarities anyways between what Jesus was teaching, between what we see in the Bible, and what you still see today in that religion. It's the group of people, right? It, within Judaism, if you want to call it that, you had those who were saved and those who were unsaved. You had those that believed on the Lord, that believed Moses, that believed the Father, and then there's those that didn't, right? And they were, they were mixing the Lord and the right religion with other beliefs, with other false doctrines, just as we have people today that are called Christians, but they're not really following Christ. Entire denominations of people that are just completely screwed up and teaching false things and have made up false gods. Well, the Pharisees were doing the same thing. This whole group of people who were, you know, what we today might call uh, Judaism, right? They were, in, they were in that religion, but it wasn't because the Judaism just continued the, the religion of the Pharisees the way that we know it today, the, the, the religion of Judaism. Whereas believers who have existed before Christ and then existed after Christ, now we know them as Christians. But Jesus said, hey, you're of your father the devil. He's a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. And that's another test of, of just being saved in general. If you're of God, you're going to hear God's words. Hear meaning you're going to receive them and understand. Let's go back to 1 John chapter 2. We'll close out here. Verse number 24, Let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. And, that, and it boils down, it is believing that, believe that truth, to, to be uh, a child of God. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you all of all things, and is truth and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Now, people will also like to, to run away with this passage as well, when it says, the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. Okay, we've received an anointing, we've received the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, Right, that abides with us, that will lead us and guide us into all truth. And that absolutely is true. And we don't need that any man teach you. You know, anything that is true should come from the Scripture, and the Holy Ghost can lead anyone into that truth. But this doesn't mean that now, well, see, since I don't need any man to teach me, then I just don't have to go to church. That's, that's, a, that's a logical fallacy, a logical leap there that you take that goes too far. Because if that were the case, then why did God give teachers and pastors like Ephesians chapter 4 says? And why does Hebrews chapter 10 say that we're not like, uh, you know, the manner of some is they forsake the assembling of, uh, of themselves together, right? That we shouldn't be forsaking the assembly and that we need to come to church so much the more as you see the day approaching. So no, you don't need any man to teach you in the sense that the truth is the truth and, the whole, and God gave us the Holy Spirit to help guide us into all truth. But it's still very beneficial to have someone to teach and to, and to help you along the way and help you to grow through the truth of God's word. But you don't have to, what this is teaching, you don't have to rely on like, like the Catholic Church would do of saying, well, you just need to have this man or else you can't understand the truth. That's not true. That is not true. You're not, you're not required to just have to have this man to tell you. You don't have to have this God man here to tell you what you have to believe and what this really says because you all would never be able to get it otherwise. That is not true. It's like you don't need to have a math teacher 
for you to ever understand that one plus one is two. Right? That's a truth. You could come up to that truth many ways. But if you have a teacher, they can help you get to that point faster. Right? Makes sense. So you don't need to have that. That's, and that's what this is saying. You don't need any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie. And even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. Verse 28, Now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. We want to abide in him. We want to have good fellowship with him. We want to be close to him. We want to know him. All these things that have been taught. And just like John chapter 15 was teaching about abiding in him and bringing forth fruit, we don't want to be ashamed. We don't want to be these servants when he shows up and be like, okay, I'm here. What have you been doing? And being like, uh, nothing. I don't know. But like when I, when I go to my kids' room, I tell them, okay, kids, clean your room. And I go and do work and I'm busy for a few hours and then I come back and I'm like, what have you been doing? <laughs> uh, playing a video game? <laughs> like, whatever. Come on, you, you, we don't want to be ashamed like that when, when, you know, when Jesus Christ is like, well, I'm coming back. Yep. So we don't want to be ashamed before him as coming. Amen. And it doesn't mean you're not saved. It just means, hey, do, listen to him, abide with him, you know, be close to him, do what he has you to do. Obey his commandments. Have a good fellowship. Be in good communion with the Lord. That when he shall appear, we have confidence and not be ashamed before him as coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. And we'll get more into that in chapter 3 because that ties perfectly into chapter 3. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for uh, the great truths found here in this epistle from the Apostle John. I pray that you please help us to understand these truths and apply them in our own lives, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to become better Christians and that you would teach us and guide us into all truth and understanding and that, um, Lord, that we would be mindful to serve you throughout the whole week, throughout our life, and that we wouldn't be ashamed at your coming, but that we could really get to know you and be close to you and abide in you, dear Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.